If you remember last week, do you remember last week? What did we talk about? Somebody dressed up in a ridiculous costume talking about something or another, right? The prodigal son story, Jesus once again telling the Pharisees to drop their self-righteousness and be a little bit more serving and more, and more um, uh, humble in their, in their dealings. And Wednesday night, we talked about this from the Gospel of Luke. The sinner woman that broke into the party and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her, with her tears and wiped them with her hair. And now, we're six days before Passover. Now, this is just before, if you read in the Gospel of John, chapter 11, this is where he raised Lazarus. So now we've come to this part where Lazarus is now risen and alive and, and well and at, at the dinner at his house. And now they're preparing for what's to come. Interesting that Jesus knows what's going on. Mary knows what's going on. But I think the rest of them have always had blinders on what was going on, what was going to happen to Jesus. Jesus told his disciples two or three times, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to get killed and three days later arise. And they just had their earplugs in. They didn't want to listen to that. They couldn't bear to see their, their rabbi, their teacher, their mentor leave them. So here we are at the house of Lazarus. It seems like a twist of priorities. Nard, this little plant that only grows in the Himalayas, in India, that's why it's so expensive. It, it, they, they, they harvest it, they bring it down, they travel through camel caravan or, or merchants or whoever to get it. And she must have saved up a lot of money for this. Or possibly she had used part of that to anoint Lazarus' body when he died. We don't know for sure. We know that she has it. And that it was really expensive, like a year's wages worth of stuff. Now, we could get, if we had the uh, Easter lilies in here, we'd have more of a sense of it because we could smell the Easter lilies. Get, a, get an idea what it might be like with this, this nard that's wafting through the air, this perfume that you can't resist, maybe even sometimes even stifling. It's so strong. Here's a shift in priorities. Now, we read this. As modern people, yeah, a year's wages. What in this? Somebody calculated out about twelve thousand dollars for this stuff, a pound for twelve thousand dollars. Yeah, Chanel number no. five never cost that much, as far as I know. We're thinking in our minds, yeah, of course, spend it. You know, give the money to the poor, do something with it. Why this waste? Why do? Why does she bother doing this? Well, we don't know for sure. We, we suspect that she was really grateful. I mean, bring your brother back from the dead. Now, that's something special. You can't express the gratitude in something like that. On the other hand, she was preparing him for what's to come. She had an idea that he was going to pass, and this is the way she was going to prepare him. In either case, Jesus once again stifles those voices that seemed to be a little self-righteous, a little bit self-centered, as Judas was. He knew Judas' heart. He knew that Jesus, Jesus, Judas and Jesus, Judas, Judas. Okay, say that five times fast. Judas would have skimmed off the top. He would have taken his percentage, or maybe most of it, for his own sake, for his own needs, whatever they were. Jesus was having none of it. He's pointing to them that this is a big event. My time has come very, very near. Passover is just around the corner. I'm going to be dead in a few, in a week or two. We look at that with modern eyes and think, wow. Her act of kindness, her act of discipleship. And that's what John's gospel is mainly about, is showing us what discipleship was really about. Here's a prime example of someone giving selflessly of the money she could have had for something that she needed and wanted, but yet gave it away to something she felt was really important. She had this talent, and no one was going to tell her what to do with it. She wasn't Judas's place to say, you've got these gifts, this is what you need to do with your gifts. I'm going to try to control you and what you've been given and uh, tell you what to do with it. That's absurd. God gives us all gifts to do what we can with them. Now, this Mary, with anointing, she didn't 
prevent him from dying on the cross. She didn't prevent anything. All she did was what she could do to prepare it. Sometimes that's all we can do is what we can do. Although it seems limited at times. You know, just move the project forward a bit. That's all we ask. You have your part to play in this. In, in our lives. What, what goal are we going for? We may not reach the goal. We may be like Moses and lead the people just so far. And then someone else has to take over and lead the people forward. Into the promised land. We seem so limited sometimes, and that's okay. That's why we have each other, this, this congregation, this community that we all share our gifts, and maybe at some point we can only do so much ourselves and someone else needs to take over and continue the journey on. And this is simply what Mary was doing, was her part in this whole journey of Jesus. He's made a long trek. He's on his way to Jerusalem for some important things, and she's doing what she can to prepare him for his final journey. And how often do we do that, just to prepare people for their journey, or be with people on their journeys? I have high hopes for the new Pope, Pope Francis, who took his name after Francis of Assisi. This is the guy that, that uh, rents an apartment, cooks his own meals, and takes the bus to work. The vow of poverty and service to the poor are strong in his order of Jesuit. And we hope, and there is hope, that he will kind of focus the church back into this regard for the poor, the oppressed, the things that Jesus wanted to do in his lifetime and did in his lifetime and tells us to do in our lifetimes. And do what you can for the poor, the oppressed, those who are hurting, those who need help. It may not be much, but it may be just enough to get things moving along, just enough to make a difference. We go down to soup kitchens wherever we can and we seem to, to build some relationships for a time and we serve some meals and that's enough for the day. And then other people come in other days and take over and establish relationships and feed the poor. But yet we have that important role to play. We have that role to play in all of our lives. And who is it for us to judge what others do with their gifts? If my gift is for mission work outside in the, in the other parts of the world, that's my gift. If my gift is mission work in Cedarburg, that's my gift. If my gift is being hospitable to people within the confines of this building, that's my gift. If it's to make people feel good about themselves in any way I can, that's my gift. If I have money left over and I give it to some charity organization, that's my gift. It's not for anybody to say. God was with Jesus in those moments. Jesus comes in the name of the Lord. Next week, Palm Sunday, and we'll hear more about this. The people hear the story, and they're waiting with bated breath to find out what's next. We press on for the goal of the call, heavenly call of God, as Paul writes. The heavenly call of God. And what is that? Sometimes it takes us a lifetime to figure out what that is. Sometimes we know right away what that is for us. And we devote our energy and our time and our talents and our money and whatever it is to make this happen. What would it look like if the Catholic Church rechanged focus to help the poor and the oppressed? What would it look like if our church, everything about it, went for the poor and oppressed? What would that look like? How would that make a difference in this community of faith? In this community called Cedarburg Grafton, in this community of Wisconsin, we all have our parts to play. And I believe the church is starting to refocus their energies to find out what the true priorities are. Possibly this nard could have been sold for a lot of money, but it was given for Jesus. For his sake. And as we go about our lives, we remember Jesus' words, as you did to the least of the me, least of these you did to me too. What did you find I was poor, oppressed, in prison? What did you do? Well, that was me. Remember the poor. Remember them always.
God was with Jesus in this moment. God is with Mary. God is with us at all of our moments of our lives. How we decide to use our gifts is our calling to God. Responses for the great gifts and sacrifices that Jesus has given us. We look at this lesson today and the lessons previous and we, with all humility, give to those who do not have to make life a little better. To go into the inner city or our own city to find people who are hurting and do response whether it's giving them money, serving their food, building relationships. There's a story about uh, Bill Gates in an interview. Uh, they said that Melinda Gates is a, is a tried and true Catholic church every Sunday. Phil, well, not so much. <laughs> On the days that she didn't go to church, he didn't go either. One interviewer said, well, why, what's the reason for that? And Bill said, I find going to church on Sunday morning is highly inefficient. There's a lot more things I could be doing on Sunday morning than going to church. Yeah, probably. It's probably not an efficient use of our time. But it's not about, about the bottom line necessarily about our time. It's about that time that we spend focused, praising, seeking, listening to what the Holy Spirit is telling us so that we can be empowered, enriched, to go out and do those things like Mary did and pour the proverbial nard on whomever needs it at the time. That is our calling. That is the God who is with us, with Jesus, with Mary. All of the time, giving us what we need for the journey ahead, and it is enough for us. Praise God. Amen.